Have you been exploring your spirituality and learning more about yourself? And now you're ready to take bold, positive action. Are you seeking clarity about what is really blocking you from your greatest potential? Do you feel like you're so close to a breakthrough, but you can't figure out why you continue to feel stuck at the same level? Join us now for Real Talk with Joyce and Jennifer, two transformational coaches who are eager to share all they've learned over the many years they've each been working with clients, helping them create the life they want. Joyce and Jennifer both have extensive, diverse backgrounds in the art of conscious transformation, and they are here to help you. So tune in now for the insight and tools you need to consciously live, work, and play so that you can live the life you most deeply long to experience. Hi everyone, Joyce here. Welcome to Real Talk with Joyce and Jennifer. I'm a transformational coach, life purpose facilitator, mind body teacher who guides clients to live their most wild, courageous, authentic lives. Hey everyone, it's Jennifer, and I'm also a transformational coach, facilitator, and consultant, which means I transform the mentality of leaders so that their entire staff and corporate culture can shift toward higher purpose. But most importantly, I'm a mom. (laughs) So today we're having a dialogue about discover your vision, and we're really excited about this. So last week, I was not on the call because I was at a conference uh, on co-creating a new civilization, um, which was put on by uh, STEM University. And um, so a lot of the visions we're talking about is things that I was there learning about, about really launching new things that are being created, new principles of doing things and not having all the old principles come forth anymore. So one of the major themes of that conference was Uh, was discussed was the importance of manifesting a new vision on how we want our world to be in the future. You know, it's clear to most of us that we need a radical revision of our values and beliefs and attitudes about many aspects of our culture and environment. You know, particularly, I would say, in ecology, um, in politics, certainly in politics, in education, in medicine, and in our judicial system. Just to mention a few, but these are the ones that are flying out at me. So we also need a radical shift in the awareness and consciousness of most people. We must, you know, we must all change our thought process and our deeply ingrained beliefs about the earth and each other. You know, we just cannot continue to see ourselves as separate from the earth and other people. One of my favorite teachers, uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton, who's the author of Biology of Belief, says that science now acknowledges that we are deep in the sixth mass extinction, including the fate of human civilization. So the fifth previous extinction, one which wiped out the dinosaurs, um, you know, were due to physical factors such as comets or asteroids hitting the Earth. The current mass extinction, according to scientists, is directly attributed to our human behavior. So the beliefs we hold about ourselves and the role we play in the world have undermined the environment and are destroying the web of life. If we want to save our planet, we must change our beliefs and story about how that nature and man co-partner in healing the earth. There's no other way to do this. And I'll speak more about earth medicine at another time, but uh, I just wanted to bring you up on where I was last week. Um, So two of the most powerful ways uh, I know, and and Jennifer and I both believe that, uh, you know, healing of ourselves and the earth is by waking up and healing our old wounds and beliefs and creating a vision for your life, you know, that actually includes your purpose, which is what we've talked about since we've been on the air. So what do you think, Jennifer? Well, I totally agree, Joyce, and and you make so many uh, strong and and valuable points here. Um, (laughs) It it does conjure up inside of me how it it really, I find it very bizarre when people are, 
you know, yelling at one group about taking accountability, but then they're not willing to take accountability for the destruction of the earth. So it's just, you know, again, there's all this. Iron, irony and hypocrisy <laughs> floating around yeah. in the world right now. But what it all comes down to is what you've said, which is beliefs. And so I agree, we do all need to change our beliefs. Um, and, and as you know, I've worked with clients for years on doing just that. And what I've found is that it is a rare individual who actually has a vision, which makes the rest of the process of transformation extremely difficult. In fact, without a vision, it's really more work than it's worth to do mm -hmm. this transformational effort, you know, so it is practically a waste of time. Most clients, when they come to me, have no idea what they want. They are more clear about what they don't want, which is based on the pain of their current situation. So as easy as it sounds to say that we all need to change our thought process, which is absolutely true, boy, is that a tall order. Mm -hmm. Yet, as you imply, Joyce, clearly the way the world is functioning today is not working, not in the sense that allows we as a whole to prosper, not to mention the fact of Mother Nature. And, you know, Mother Earth right now doesn't seem to be happy with us. So <laughs> I think, yes, change is absolutely in order. <laughs> yes, totally, totally. How much more so do we, we want to irritate her? <laughs> right. I mean, it, it, we, there can't be a human being on the planet who doesn't believe that Mother Earth is angry and and it's trying to get us back into alignment. I mean, you just can't. <laughs> but there are. <laughs> but there are, but it's hard to believe as we go through another disaster, one right after another. Um, so let's begin with some big questions for today. First, um, what is a vision? And uh, let's start with that one. So, you know, to me, vision is sort of timeless and eternal. Um, and one of my favorite writers, uh, Ramar Vernon, who's the founder of Women of Vision in Action, says, says it beautifully. We do not create vision. We simply link into a piece of the universal vision that already exists as it filters through our perception. And I just want to unpack that for a minute. Be very clear about this. What she's saying is that we are not creating this, that we, through the, what we're going to talk about today, get into a state that of information that is already here. Every piece of information is already available on the planet for us, but we have to be able to perceive it. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. Secondly, why create a vision? Well, you know, creating a personal vision for your life, to me, is one of the most vital, life-affirming activities in which you can ever engage. It's one of the most important keys to manifesting the life you want and finding and living your life purpose. You know, and research has found that if you describe your vision and action steps in a written plan that you read daily to strengthen it, in your subconscious mind, you are you're probably about 60% more likely to manifest what you desire. Again, building on layers of how you're perceiving what you want and learning how to do it in a more powerful way. Dr. Beckwith, uh, Dr. Michael Beckwith, who's again one of my just very favorite people in the world, um, who's the uh, minister of Agape Spiritual Living Center and a true transformational uh, leader in the world. Um, says that people who have no vision for their life are sleepwalking without a hint as to why they are here or what their purpose is. And is that so true? So they're, they're just sort of drifting along on the current of culture's beliefs of the day. Whether those beliefs are good or bad, people who don't have a vision, who are not open to their purpose in life, are living on the edge of life and usually out of fear. They're the average men and women who live on the collective beliefs of society and seem to be at the whim of, of any force that comes along outside of themselves. And the word is outside of themselves, not internally. So whatever newscast they hear that day or whatever gossip they hear or whatever it looks like is the truth, you, you respond to it. And that is affecting your belief system because you don't even know if that's true. So finally, how do we create or discover a vision of the future? Well, number one, we need to think big. We need to think from a higher vibration. We need to create from the future 
because we do not want to create from the energy of the normal, ordinary mind that most of us are in a lot of the time. Right. And so I want to I want to go back and, and touch on something you said, um, because the first quote talked about how we don't create a vision. We're, we're tapping into something bigger. But then we we're talking overtly in the show about discovering and creating your vision. So what I want to clarify for others is that the way we're using the word create is really to um, allow yourself just to be open to that transformative process, which means allowing your mind to tap into something bigger than where you are. And that is the creation we speak of. And so, so it go, kind of goes back to what Albert Einstein said, that no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it, right? So we can't create from that lower vibration mentality that started our problems to begin with, meaning we made decisions based out of fear instead of love. You know, or we believe we weren't deserving of something, or we come from a space of lack and scarcity instead of a, a, a mentality of abundance, um, or we're just in an unconscious, ordinary mindset that you talked about, Joyce, which is kind of following the culture's lead, mm -hmm. whether it's good or bad, right? We can't expect to manifest a powerful vision that way, and we certainly can't expect ourselves to transform our lives or create a better life experience. So we absolutely have to tap into something bigger, bolder, more loving, more nurturing, because what we manifest is the same level of thinking and manifesting that we already have if we don't. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we have to choose love over fear when we're in this process. So let's come mm -hmm. back after the break, Joyce, because you've got another good question to pose to pull this all together. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to do some storytelling as well. So stay with us. Your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Host your show on IOM FM, the radio network of Om Times Media, one of the more recognized brand names in the conscious community, and is backed by the extensive marketing reach of Om Times. Hosting a show on IOM FM immediately connects you with our extensive, dedicated community. Have you or someone you love ever experienced a major loss? The kind of loss so cataclysmic that it divided life into before and after? The death of a beloved person or pet? The loss of a job, a health challenge, can leave us feeling empty, lost, alone, wondering if we'll ever feel joy again. Loss is universal. Grief is part of the human condition. But in our modern world, we've lost the ability to understand, share, and integrate our grief. We're expected to grieve privately and quickly get over it. This November 3rd through 5th, the Atlanta Grief and Loss Center will be hosting a retreat that will allow you to fully feel, integrate, and catalyze your grief. Our retreat is called Heartbroken Open, Grief as a Sacred Path to Renewal and Rebirth. If you are grieving, or if you work with clients who are grieving, you'll find more information about this powerful retreat at atlantagriefandlosscenter.com slash retreats, or call 404-881-1322. More than 24 million Americans have an autoimmune disorder, and that number continues to grow. I'm Sharon Saylor, and I'm one of those 24 million. To put that number in perspective, cancer affects about 9 million and heart disease up to 22 million. That's why I've brought together top experts and those thriving regardless of their diagnosis to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information. Join me, Sharon Saylor, Friday night, 7 p.m. Eastern, for the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio to find out how to live your life uninterrupted. Listen and imagine. It takes five seconds to send a text, and for those five seconds, you're driving blind. Life is worth more than a text. Stay alive. Don't text and drive. Visit StopTextStopRex.org, a message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, Noise, and the Ad Council. So 
before the break, Joyce, you had some great questions. You know, what is a vision? Why do we create one? How, how do we create one? And you have one more. Let's touch on that before we mm -hmm. move on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, Jennifer, before we move on, I want to make that great announcement before we get into that question, because I think you're what you just talked about, about high level um, thinking and not come, not solving, uh, we're not be able to solve issues in the same energy that we created them in. So I want to talk about what we talked about, our, our just great surprise here. So today, just a minute ago, uh, before we came online, I heard uh, I was on, actually saw this on Facebook, and uh, that former President Barack Obama had announced today that he's inviting leaders from around the globe next month to come to Chicago, where they'll be talking about ideas and plans to solve some of the world's problems. So for me, this is fabulous because it's just on the tail end of where I went and what we're talking about vision here today. And so Barack doing this is very powerful. It is the it is a big vision because it's what we all want is to come together with people who are a higher vibration. Remember, high vibration, not the same vibration the problem was in. He so that's where he's going to be creating from. So anyway, I, I just had it to share is exciting. that. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it, very it, exciting and it's <laughs> refreshing to have uh, vision again, right? Because we're, we we see yes. our culture and our society getting so stuck in conflict, which is the antithesis of what we teach. So <laughs> it, we get very excited when we see world leaders grabbing a vision and running with it. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, absolutely. So let's keep on with uh, our next uh, question, which is what is the difference between our vision and our purpose, which is a little confusing sometimes because they're, they're similar in some ways, but I'm just giving you my definition. Uh, so to have a vision is to have a larger, more encompassing, deeper view of either your life issues that you, whatever you want to work on and are your business uh, or project that includes your intentions, your actions for creating your life. And uh, your purpose to me answers the questions, why am I here? Why am, what am I here for? And what am I, what am I doing? How am I doing it? Uh, it's also how you can deliver your unique gifts and talents that serves others. So it answers a different, to me, it answers a different group of questions. Um, so Jennifer, you might have a different take on that but no I think it's great I think you've given some great questions and great explanations and and I you know I, I would like to add some thoughts to the mix but it's really about how this applies in the workplace and so by now we all know that I integrate all the concepts that we mm -hmm. talk about each week into the workplace and so for just a second I'm going to use these experiences that I've had with business leaders as a microcosm of what you're referring to and so with the first question what is vision it is often posed as what's the difference between a vision statement and a mission statement in in the workplace but really we're not talking about strategic planning in the strictest sense when we talk about vision in this sense. Vision, whether it's for an individual or a business leader impacting hundreds of employees, is basically the same. We just have to get clear about what we want, not in detail or specificity, but begin to identify what it is that we want to experience. So for a business, what is it you want to do to improve the world? or to improve your customers, your, your, your own customer's experience, right? Or your employee's experience. It's, it's just so much about the experience itself, the feelings, as opposed to, you know, the traditional goals that we've always been taught about the material desires, like salaries and titles and luxury cars and big houses. I think people have trouble creating a vision because most are simply trying to be happy and they are pushing themselves really hard to figure out what that is that's going to make them happy and then how to make money doing it. <laughs> so yeah. creating a vision is just so much more than that. And what makes it hard is that a vision is something greater than what we've already experienced in our lives. And therefore, we're basically asking ourselves to come up with something that our minds have no information to pull from. So to, mm -hmm. to some degree, it is somewhat reactive because we have to create something based on the experiences we, we don't like. We just don't want to stop there. We want to push it into more of a proactive stance. 
And so since our brain really loves comfort zones and habits and addictions, it basically rejects the notion of searching for an unknown, like a vision, which is why we as humans typically perpetually recreate history. Vision is about possibilities instead. Mm -hmm. Great, great, great point, Jennifer. Um, so as you know, every possibility is already created in the universe, as we said earlier. We just need to be able to perceive it. And another way to look at vision is it is, it is your mental picture of what you would love for your life, your business, or a project, fully described in writing and a representative in pictures. Sometimes we can see the immediate sequence of steps we need to take to map a plan of action to bring vision into form. And you know, at other times, we can only see one step at a time. And I think I shared with you in an earlier uh, earlier radio show that when I when I started my business, I only um, when I moved from New York to Atlanta and started my business ag again here, I only had I had just when I did this process, all I got was women empowerment. I got nothing about where they were, nothing about how I would find them. All I knew was that. And mm -hmm. sometimes all you get is is a few words and that's it. And then you have to wait till more comes or you just start where you are to create whatever it is that you're wanting. So, mm -hmm. so how do we allow vision to flow through us? Um, how do we manifest it? So to me, timing is one of the most important factors in a vision manifesting. If we force it or try to fit it into our mental constructs or frameworks, of understanding time, we will grow frustrated and fearful of timelines that are not met because they're not going to be. Uh, so if, uh, if due to our fears, we rush a vision into being before it's ready to be birthed, it'll fall apart or it'll be sluggish or not happen. So here's one of my favorite examples, just like a caterpillar in the chrysalis, who's waiting to be birthed in the imaginal sales field, but is pushed out of the period of gestation. It will not survive and become a butterfly. It will literally die. But if it's able to wait for the period of gestation, it will become what it's meant to be, a beautiful butterfly. So if we wait for our own vision to be birthed and not pushed along, our vision will fulfill itself far beyond anything our human mind can conceive of. And I know it's hard to believe that, and I certainly, I certainly have not always believed that because it's our tendency in this culture to push and push and push, and after a while, things aren't coming, and we just don't know what's going on, and it's very frustrating. So mm -hmm. here's an example of one of my projects very recently that was birthed too soon and went nowhere. So recently I started a GoFundMe project for creating an art center. I had, uh, had not really thought it through out of the project and I didn't have enough time to really manage the campaign. So basically it went nowhere and I only raised a few hundred dollars for opening this uh, center that I wanted. So recently uh, while I was at this conference, I met with an artist at, at this conference who offered to help me figure out how to obtain funding for my project, and he, which he had already been doing for his project. And he said, oh, it's not that hard. Uh, talk to me, call me, and we'll get come up with some ideas. So that's an organic way that you're letting life come in with far greater information than what I had for this, obviously. So in, in probably about a month or so, I'll restart this project again. I'm not letting it go. But this time, I'm not going to hurry the project, and I'll allow more time to sort of dream about how the project can come forth. And, and hopefully, this is going to create the center that I really want called the Dreaming Room. Yes, so. and, and it, will, it will come to fruition, I have no doubt. <laughs> and, and, you know, you describe that. 
um, as your experience, but gosh, everyone can relate to this when we get in such a hurry. And, and as they say, patience is a vir virtue. I, I don't know how many times I've said this in coaching sessions, but you know, there's an old saying, timing is everything. But the catch is that it's divine timing. We're not in charge of timing, right? It's everything's in perfect divine mm -hmm. order. And it's, you know, it just leads me to another human pitfall in this transformational process, which is the desire for instant gratification. So when someone comes to one of us for transformational coaching, it is often, as I said before, because their pain points have reached an all time high and the person or client is desperate to fix their situation. And you probably see this too, Joyce, um, which is why I feel like I'm speaking for both of us on this because it's so common, but that's a short term need and nothing good comes from desperation, right? Because as we said, the feeling or thought that started this cannot be what fixes it. <laughs> so creating the life that you want is a marathon, not a sprint. There is a total process of discovery here that is invaluable. So as each of us moves along our journey, the real key is increasing our consciousness to what we are experiencing as we go, how we are creating that experience and also how we need to change our perspectives in order to get different outcomes. So we discover this insight through our experiences. It's not a one time fix it situation. And as you said, in the analogy of the caterpillar dying before in a butterfly Joyce, it really is very similar. When mm -hmm. we try to force our lives onto a new path as a reaction to the path and the pain that the path we're on causes, we will typically do nothing more than cause more pain. Mm. <laughs> so creating a vision is part of this process. We discover it, we shape it, and we reshape it as we learn and grow. But we do have to start somewhere, which is why I ask people typically to focus on the feelings and the experiences in the beginning, not the tangible goals. If we don't at least try to create a starting point for a vision, our brains will absolutely default to our old neural pathways and simply do what we have always done and strive for what we've already achieved. And basically, we'll just spin our wheels. So when we come back, let's talk a little bit more about how to do this and where to go from here. Mm -hmm. Free your mind with Ohm Times Radio, IOM FM. Change and growth are part of natural life and also part of your spiritual life. Everyone needs support and guidance, especially during life passages. Upgrade yourself with the Ohm Times Experts program. With Ohm Times Experts, you have access to the best intuitive coaches, spiritual teachers, counselors, astrologists, and oracles. Our team was carefully selected so you can trust. Find out more at experts.ohmtimes.com. Depleted by the rat race? Depressed by the attitudes of the human race? The book Honor explains why and how to transform your life from confusion and heartache to one that you most authentically desire. Join Ohm Times Radio host Jennifer McKenna Weinbaum as she takes you on her journey from her darkest period to her happiest and healthiest life. Entertaining, enlightening, honor will help you find and maintain the love and light in your own life. Visit www.universalabundance.com to pre-order your copy. Hello, I'm Lisa Berry. Join me every Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for Light on Living, a chance to see new hear different, and feel more as I shine the spotlight on all the ways to lighten the load of life's challenges. Light on Living is your link to that new way you're looking for, that new understanding that will enhance your life, and that positive connection that will support your growth. So join me and you'll gain insight and start to see things in a new way that motivates you. Listen, my life changed because someone was there to get me to use drugs. No one can understand, People think that having someone who will listen makes it better. I need help. I'm listening. I need help. I think that having someone who will listen makes it better. People understand. No one can get me to use drugs. 
My life changed because someone was there to listen. Go to heretolisten.com for tips and tools to turn addiction around. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Okay. So welcome back. Before we went to a break, I was just saying that basically if we don't try to start creating a vision, um, then our, you know, our brains will default to our old neural pathways. And, and yet, even though that causes us to spin our wheels, somehow our life purpose still knows us, as Joyce pointed out in our first show. And voila, the second we tune back into our consciousness, instead of just allowing our unconscious mental and physical physical habits to ensue, then the vision is usually right there for us to start to see again and for it to evolve. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, you know, I've observed many times that I do not hold the vision, but the vision is holding me. And by what I mean by that is often there's the idea comes to me and keeps coming over and over. And I'm not quite aware of what all the pieces are, but slowly but surely it becomes, it, it will become more clear because somehow I have um, attached to this in, in the field um, that this is where I'm going with my life. And so it's, uh, so manifestation really requires faith and trust and surrender to a higher power than oneself. And that's for sure. If you're going to use this technique, you have to surrender to believe that there is a higher power there that wants to help you to create the life you want. It, it, it just dying. I mean, it just really wants to help you. It's doing everything it can to wake you up and make you conscious so you'll be ready to do what you want in the world. So let's figure out how to create a powerful vision. And so, um, I frequently use uh, parts of, and maybe parts of my own, uh, I use Michael Beckwith's Life Visioning Transformative Process. And this is a great book, or his tapes, um, his CDs that you can listen to in the car that goes over this process. So I, I highly recommend, he's, he's taught this all over the world. So here are some of the elements of the vision process. So certainly getting quiet, um, schedule a consistent time and select a special space where you can sit quietly, silence your, silence your mind, breathe deeply, and connect to your higher self or your essence, whatever that is for you, it does not matter. It is important to quiet your mind so you can connect with a positive energy source or a higher vibrational energy source. So when you feel that you've reached that state of openness and receptivity, silently affirm to yourself that your readiness, you're ready to enter the vision process. And you can feel that if you meditate enough, that when you're relaxed and you're kind of in that zone, that now you're receptive to information coming to you. So the next step is mentally place your questions before your higher self. So you we're going to ask the questions that I'm going to be reading. So you can have these questions written down on a piece of paper or in a journal, or you can sort of know them before you go into this meditative state. So here's some of the questions um, that I suggest. What is the highest vision for your life? You notice I'm not saying, what do I want? Because what I want is a very low vibration because it comes from the ego. The ego will tell you everything you want, but that's not what you're asking for. You're asking for to be revealed what is the highest vision for my life, which is a very different question. Or what is the highest vision for my business or project? What must I become to empower the vision? What must be released for me to do this? What must be embraced? Also, what talents, gifts, skills, and qualities do I already possess that will serve this vision? So when you finish your questions, enter a state of gratitude, knowing that the vision is already taking form and you're now ready to allow it into full expression. So 
you can there's a, the next process you can either stop with that process and work on that or at a later period you can add, you can start with this process so the two exercises go together very well so the third part of this is visualize what you want so you've gone from asking the questions and getting clarity and some information to now taking what you want and putting it working with your mind focusing your mental picture of what you would love for your life whether that be your health your finances your relationships or your career or business project so you describe in detail how do each of these areas look and feel and expand what you've written previously the more vivid you can paint and then describe in detail what you want the easier it's going to be for you so i'm talking about really looking at not just going in there and seeing it vaguely i'm talking about really experiencing what does this look like if it, you know if i want a house what does it look like where is it see yourself in the house see yourself outside see yourself walking around the neighborhood i mean you got to feel it and envision it number 4 is use vi- use vibrant high energy words use vibratory words such as i am the name of the that's the name of the divine within us which helps your mind embrace and retain the picture of what you desire for example i am so grateful for my good health i'm vibrant and flexible the more clearly you can visualize what you want the easier it is to manifest and the fifth one is see the vision as already happening start with the end in mind all great athletes and visionaries and successful business leaders see the results they desire and they work backwards through the action steps you do not need to know all the details of how the vision will manifest you do not want to focus on the how this is going to happen you leave the details to a greater consciousness than yourself and you focus your thoughts your emotions and see yourself in the vision of what you desire so when i'm creating a vision i usually use a big piece of paper or a flip chart or sometimes i just use a journal and i'm pulling all of this information together sometimes i even use pictures and words and colors and cards and items to help clarify what i desire for my life or business So creating your life vision will require continuous effort and some time to formulate and you know and reshape it. This project requires you to really shut out the noise of the world and sit quietly in meditation, silence or prayer. Doing so will enable you to connect with your higher self and in order to ex- access your creativity, your intuitive abilities and your reserve of deeper gratitude. So now really think about your health, your finances, your relationships, career, business, or any other area you desire to envision change. Record all thoughts, impressions, and feelings which arise from each area. And do not allow the mind to judge them, and tell you that this is impossible or silly or you don't have the money. And so once you have a rough draft, you'll can you'll continuously add to and reshape your vision. as it kind of flows and continues from your deeper desire of how you would love to live your life. Yeah, these are great steps, Joyce, and I I would like to clarify I I think that for those who are new to this process, there may be some confusing concepts because mm-hmm. you know, starting out and saying don't ask yourself what you want because the ego will paint a different picture. That is likened to what I said in the beginning about don't focus mm-hmm. on those tangible goals, right? we want you to focus on the experience. So by the time you evolve through this process and you get to getting clarity around that vision and visualizing yourself in that house, the you will evoke a desire that is at a higher vibrational level. You're looking at it from an experience standpoint. How do I want to feel when I walk in this room? Who do I want to, you know, be with and and share this with and and that type of thing. So it's an evolutionary process and I wanted just to really mm-hmm. stress that. Um there's also uh, some other pieces of this that I'd like to touch on because 
it, it brings up stories. You know, I said we were going to get into some storytelling. I've got two big stories, and so if people don't mind, if, if you don't mind, Joyce, and our listeners don't mind. No, because go ahead. One's a client, well, one's a client story and one's a personal story, but they both really <laughs> kind of illustrate all that what you described here. So, um, so not too long ago, I was working with an architecture firm, and once I got in there to investigate the root of the issues that they originally called me for, one of the biggest missing pieces that I found was a lack of vision. And so when I interviewed employees, um, most of them felt unimportant and were disengaged from their work. Turnover was spiking. Um, some even used the term minion when referring to how they felt they were treated. <laughs> so mm. these are examples of what can happen inside a corporate culture when there is not a vision for leaders to inspire their employees with. And without a vision, the firm became a proverbial factory uh, it was an inadvertent. Nobody intended for that to happen. Um, but the um, you know employee was simply required to do their part to get the final product to completion. There was no esprit de corps. There was no inspiration or meaningful motivation. It was just a job. And they were, as a firm, doing fun social activities on the side to try to make it a fun place to work. But it really only became a mixed message to the employees. It was like, look, this is a great place to be, when really it wasn't. A fun social event here and there didn't compensate for the meaningful experience each and every day where each person was hoping to be genuinely mentored and given the opportunity to contribute their unique talents and skills and gifts to come together and create truly exceptional outcomes. So every company can have that, you know, the the great mentorship and great opportunities and the meaningful motivation, but it absolutely requires a vision. Otherwise, there's no sense of camaraderie or reason for employees to invest emotionally or to engage meaningfully in the work itself. So instead of adopting a vision on how to be the best architecture firm in the city or the region, they created a vision about just creating the best firm to work for. And that was a game changer for them. And, and to this day, they continue to discover how to do that better and better and better. Because again, it's an evolutionary process that ultimately revolutionizes a culture. And so we'll take a quick break. And when we come back, I'm going to tell you that personal story. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Best of the conscious minds in the world. Home Times Radio, your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site, but a spiritual dating site with a purpose to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free, ascendinghearts.com. My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern on Ohm Times Radio, and we'll explore these topics and so much more on Destination Unlimited. Chris, you're not acting like a grown-up in our relationship. M2, M2! There's your comic book collection, the race car bed. I'm young at heart, but I put money into my 401k every paycheck. I'm taking control over my financial life, and that feels pretty grown up to me. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free ideas and easy ways to save, go to feedthepig.org. That's feedthepig.org. Are those footy pajamas? This message brought to you by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the Ad Council. So welcome back. Before the break, I was telling a, a client story about the... Um, a lack of vision in the workplace, and now I, I, I humbly would like to share my personal story about vision. Uh, I know I've mentioned my background before, but I mentioned it at a high level, and I'm going to elaborate a bit this time, um, but it's primarily about my health. As a child, I had 104 fever every other week for a long period of time. 
I was finally sent to a special pediatrician that was also an epidemiologist at the time because they just couldn't keep me on antibiotics any longer. And, um, and so they put me on an experimental drug and I got a shot in my arm nearly every week for six years from about the age of six to 12. So they basically had to rebuild my immune system. And it definitely saved my life for sure. But then in my 20s, I was a workaholic and I did not take good care of my body. I drank a lot of alcohol as a means to have fun and I smoked a lot of cigarettes. And as obnoxious as that sounds, given my background, it was customary for my culture. Uh, where I was raised and, and everyone I hung out with. And so it wasn't considered abusive necessarily, it was a norm. Um, but it caught up with me and I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia when I was 29. And that was life changing. It was a chronic illness that was supposed to last a lifetime under the management of pharmaceutical drugs and it was devastating. Um, but I was determined to find another way. And at that time, that's what caused me to learn about the mind-body connection. And I started yoga and I engaged in holistic practices and all kinds of things. And in fact, I learned so much at that time and transformed my health so dramatically that the experience is actually the basis of my methodology and the work that I do today. But the story wasn't over with that. 12 years later, I was then diagnosed with early stage breast cancer that caused a bilateral mastectomy and total reconstruction. And that was a major setback for the state of my health that I had achieved previously. It triggered a fibromyalgia flare for the first time in all those years. It caused an onset of psoriatic arthritis. It basically drained me of all my energy for over a year. And at the time, I was self-employed with no backup plan. I was raising two children. Um, it was just quite simply a devastating time in my life. I felt worthless, hopeless, uh, incredibly weak in every way. And, but it was in those dark hours that I took my personal vision to the next level. I had allowed my life to become so busy prior to all this that I had forgotten that my wellness was a huge part of my vision. Therefore, I had gotten off track. But I re-engaged with that vision and with the conviction of Scarlett O'Hara, <laughs> I swore <laughs> that I would find out just how strong I could be. <laughs> and so I was no longer satisfied with the status quo that I had achieved. Um, that had only it left me vulnerable to becoming my weakest. So slowly but surely, I progressively and methodically over time developed goals and executed plans that would lead me to my vision of being the strongest version of myself that I could be. And that was never a vision in my life. I never even, it, it never even entered my mind to consider that that would be a vision for me. Um, and today I do a really hard workout every morning. I love my coaches <laughs> and they actually, they actually enjoy taking pictures of me doing power lifting and pull up bars. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I absolutely love what my life has become and I'm in the highest state of vitality and health that I ever have been at the age of 48. Um, and I just really, it wasn't something that was ever in my belief system as possible until I created that vision. And so it was the vision itself that actually energized me enough to want to do the change and then to engage in the process. So thank you for allowing me to tell those two stories. <laughs> no, you, you inspire me, Jennifer. You really do. You, I, thank I know you. you've really gotten on board with your health and I'm trying to do that too. Um, so you're an inspiration to me. So. Well, thank you. I'm you know, just glad I got through telling of... the story without yeah. crying. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's okay. You can cry. We, we both cry. We're criers. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, you know, we've covered a lot of ground here today on discovering your vision, and we hope you'll uh, find the benefits as we begin the process yourself. So let's kind of recap. Um, so, you know, you consider the vision actually is this notion that it will Father, you get more and more of what you want. Secondly, give some thought to why the beginning of the process in creating a vision is so important. And thirdly, Dr. Beck's vision process by, you know, looking at that book, getting the tapes, I guarantee you you're going to love it because he's just a great teacher. Yes, and you know, speaking of his process, let's go over those steps at a high level one more time. Mm -hmm. you know, we start um, by getting in a quiet place and stilling your mind. 
And then ask your higher mm -hmm. self some high-level questions that you, you, Joyce, posed earlier, like, what is the highest vision for myself? What do I need to release for it to emerge? What do I need to embrace for it to emerge? And then actually visualize yourself living out what comes up in that vision. And so you just close your eyes and visualize. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yes, and then energize your visualization with active words, uh, especially using I am statements and get yourself in an empowered state like I am strong, I'm vibrant. Then make sure you visualize yourself with the end in mind. Do you see yourself with a trophy in your hand or hugging your grandchildren at the end of a fun day? You don't need to force it. Just allow your mind's eye to take you to that vision. Yes, and to understand what that vision represents and all the experiences you want to have. And then finally, after you come out of this visualization exercise, write it all down. And keep a working journal nearby to add to it as you go because, you know, we can't stress enough, it's an evolutionary process. Each day, you may experience something that conjures up even more clarity about what you really desire. And so just continue to make notes of it. Let it continue to emerge. Absolutely. So thanks for listening today. Uh, reach out to us if you have any questions or any uh, ground you want to cover in the future. And certainly you want to visit our websites at JoyceDillon.com or JMacConsulting.com, uh, deepening on what type of, depending on what type of insight you're looking for, you can also follow us on Facebook. And um, let's see, of course, next week uh, we're going to be, uh, I'm going to be interviewing um, uh, um, one of my good friends, uh, Melody LeBaron, on uh, loss and grief, on um, just her incredible experience. You will find it really just what she's come through in her life and all the loss and grief she's had. And uh, she and I do a workshop together on loss and grief. So it'll be a, a lot of personal stuff, my own loss and grief and Melody's, and, but based, and then talking about the platform we've created for people um, to come to this incredible weekend, uh, which is very powerful and it's a community process. Yeah, so and I, I think that's fabulous. I, mm -hmm. I'm sorry that I'm going to miss yeah. next week, but um, I am in a program next week, just as you were last week, and not the same one. But um, <laughs> and and I, I can't, you know, I, I I would like to add to that, Joyce, because I know that the two of you are doing that um, grief retreat, but I I can't stress enough because you know, we're all in midlife and um, those of us who have made it to midlife and beyond have absolutely known loss and grief at some level, whether it's been a loss of a job, a home, a loved one, a pet, um, you know, and then God bless their hearts, all the people that have, have just recently uh, lost nearly their entire material world and, yeah. and beyond. Mm -hmm. um, it's devastating. And I know for myself, as, as I experience loss and grief, it, it does have a way if we don't channel it and heal Mm -hmm. um, it does have a way of getting in the way of creating a vision because yes. I, I can remember on my own path, there was a time when I actually feared hope. <laughs> that sounds really depressing, <laughs> but I had had <laughs> such a revolving door of hardship for such a long period of time. There was a seven year stretch where it was just hardship after hardship after hardship that I got to a point, it was kind of a climax in my story, <laughs> where I remember thinking, I can't, I can't afford to hope for anything better anymore because it, it, it's only going to slam dunk me with the next hardship. And it was a horribly mm -hmm. devastating feeling. And, um, and, and so I cannot encourage our listeners enough to, to tune in next week to hear you and Melody talk. Um, and mm -hmm. to sign up for your grief retreat because, mm -hmm. you know, to feel is to heal is my big motto. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that when we don't overtly deal with our grief and loss, it will, it will sabotage our happiness and get in the way of ever seeing our vision um, 
accidentally, you know, but it will, mm -hmm. it will sabotage everything. And so, um, so I just want to give, give that extra encouragement Great. for your message. That's really, well, really thank important. you. And I totally agree that there was no way when you are grieving that even if it's, you're intentionally grieving and you're doing that and you know, you have to do that. That really is not the time for visioning anything because you really, you know, in our culture, people just do not spend time uh, grieving and even acknowledging it. It may be, you know, there may be a death in your family or you lose your home, but people want to say, well, you know, this is going to be okay. And, um, you know, I'm going to move through this. And I'm not going to experience a lot. And unfortunately, people in this culture ask you questions. How are you doing? And people respond, oh, I'm doing great when you're actually not. Grief takes a long, long, it actually takes whatever it takes. Sometimes it can take, it can take a long time. Yes. And um, so you, there is no grief time. I mean, it, obviously if it went on for years, that would be too long. But I mean, things, loss of a spouse can be a year, couple years. And uh, so join us next week. Yes, and we'll discuss this do. further. Yes, Absolutely. thanks for being here. Thanks, and take care of yourself and love yourself. Yes, be well. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.